Good evening all, and welcome. Before the video begins, I would just like to shout out my second channel. That's right, I have a second channel. It's a channel that specialises in Harry Potter and wizardy kind of stuff, so if that's what you're into, or if you just like a face reveal, and a Pandora reveal, feel free to go over to my latest video, which I'll leave at the top of the description and check it out. But anyway, for now it's time to grab your flashlight, make sure your GPS is working, then get comfortable to let the darkness take control. Back in 2006, I encountered Joseph Henry Burgess while hiking in the backcountry of northern New Mexico with a friend. He was wanted for killing an unmarried couple back in the 1970s, and was suspected of being linked to a number of other similar murders across the Pacific Northwest, California and the Southwest. We encountered him when he was only known as the Cookie Bandit, an unnamed drifter who had been breaking into cabins in the Hemis Mountains to steal food, firearms, and camping gear. He was photographed by a security camera attached to one of the cabins, and the locals had been distributing wanted posters to backpackers in the area, with instructions to contact the sheriff if we saw him, or evidence of his campsite. About eight hours into our trek, we literally rounded a bend into the canyon, and saw him sitting on a tree stump about 25 feet away. We had a brief conversation about the weather, and a hot spring which was located nearby, and then he left. As soon as he was out of sight, we pulled out the wanted poster to make sure we hadn't been talking to an abnormally filthy hippie, then turned our happy asses right back around and headed straight for the sheriff. The sheriff was unable to locate him. But three years later, he was trapped in a cabin by a pair of deputies. A shootout ensued, during which both Burgess and one of the deputies were killed. After he was identified, the FBI and Canadian law enforcement got involved with investigating his series of murders. When I was 15, I was spending a full weekend at my best friend's house. She lived on a dirt road off a rural country road in the middle of nowhere. It was probably around 3am, and we were bored, so we took a walk. This being the middle of nowhere, there was hardly any light pollution, and you can see thousands of stars in the sky. It was a clear cool night and we were just walking along, talking, with our eyes totally adjusted to the dark. All of a sudden, there was a blinding white flash, so bright I couldn't see anything but white for a split second. As suddenly as it started, it was over, and my friend and I were sitting in the middle of the road. We both must have dropped right where we stood. It was quiet again, and the sky was still clear. Sitting there in the road, totally stunned, we confirmed that we had both been blinded by a super bright light for half a second, that had apparently knocked us over. There had been no cars, no accompanying sound, just a light so bright we couldn't see anything else. We got up, went back home, and went to sleep. My friend and I drifted apart over the years, but ended up working in the same building years later, and we met up for coffee. She brought up the incident, and still remembers it the same way I do. We never figured out what exactly happened that night. My dad had a creepy experience that happened at a long train trestle set in the middle of nowhere. It didn't span much water, just a small creek and a big valley, and was maybe 80 feet high at most. Train engineers called in the middle of the night, saying someone was on the trestle, 
and he nearly hit them. Not unusual. Kids like to recreate the famous scene in Stand By Me there regularly. My dad was about a quarter of a mile away, which was not enough time for anyone to get off the thing by the time he showed up. Railroad said that the next train would have come through in around an hour, so he had time to do a quick search. He gets to the top with his lights on the cruiser and flashlight, and with the light, can see the entire thing, but he sees nothing. But he hears footsteps on the wooden planks, and shortly after something hit the bottom. He goes to where he heard something hit the brush, and he doesn't see anything. He calls for backup and the fire department. Sheriff's deputies show up with K-9 and they begin to search. They end up finding nothing. My dad says he was always a skeptic until that day, and he cannot explain what happened there. He said something jumped off that trestle, and it wasn't a deer or animal. I have lived in Southern Ohio my whole life of 23 years, being a part of the Rust Belt throughout the Midwest. Many summer days of my youth were spent with friends searching through ruins of once proud industrial warehouses, factories, and abandoned tuberculosis hospitals, and hanging out under bridges along the endless creekways we'd follow until we couldn't anymore. One of those creeks flowed through a woods on the edge of town. Several houses bordered the woods, and naturally the neighbors' kids, myself included, explored the trails often and contributed to the lore of the supposed sinister forces lurking behind the trees. Most of our stories were hearsay, or made up on the spot. But one string of summers, about seven to ten years ago, still has me trying to make sense of what me and my friends found. One night in particular, several people in town notified the police of an unidentified flying object cruising low and silent just above the tree canopy. And some days later, people reported seeing a naked slash hairless ape-like creature running in the creek and into the woods. My friends and I thought this was awesome. And would you know, we went on to search for the creature. Initially, we didn't find anything, except the usual car tires and bottles you'd find anywhere in wooded areas of all the Rust Belt states. But upon following the bike path one summer day, we found a bridge, and due to our heathen-like nature, we decided to go underneath and hang out like the weird teenage kids do. Much to our surprise, we found the corpses of two dead monkeys. They were flattened, almost like they had been run over by a steamroller. We couldn't believe it. And I still had a hard time reconciling this, and were totally baffled. We recalled the stories of the hairless ape creature that was spotted some weeks prior, and this sent a chill through all of us. Not a month later, we were building a paintball field in the woods at the edge of town. We dug out our trenches and made forts out of car tires lying around. Being proud of our creation, my buddies and I gathered the neighborhood kids to showcase the field we had worked so hard on. Once we arrived, I immediately realized something was amiss. The trail that led to the entrance had a massive tree branch obstructing the way that hadn't been there before, and it looked as if it had been torn off and set there on purpose. Proceeding further, we reached the field in the center of the woods, but there we were met with massive stones being hurtled at us from an unknown direction, some of which were the size of softballs and basketballs. We got the hell out of there as fast as we could, and a few of my buddies were brought to tears by the whole occurrence. A day or two later, I told my parents and wanted to show them. As we followed the path, we noticed there were several more large tree branches laying on the way of the trail and there in the pathway entrance to the now derelict paintball field. We found thick, 
white coloured hairs dangling from a tree branch about six feet up one of the trees. There are more of these clumps of hairs further up the tree as we could see. We grabbed the hairs and made the hell out of there. The ape creature was the first thing that came to mind then, and I believe it may have been lurking in those woods, watching us. The hairs were very dense and wire-like, very tough. I haven't seen anything like it since. In retrospect, and in talking about it with my friends today, we all recall an uneasy feeling working in the woods while we were constructing the field and the unnatural quietness that engulfed the area. There was also a very thick and particular stench that would waft back and forth. This story happened to me many years ago. I need to give you a bit of background info though, so you can fully appreciate why I took the actions I did. Back then, I was in a pretty bad situation. My girlfriend of three years had just dumped me for my best friend, which of course is a pretty crappy situation to be in. This led to a very steady decline of my mental health. I was kicked out of my home so that my girlfriend and my ex-best friend could live there instead of me, and I had quickly run out of money and options of where to live. So I was living in my car. I was losing myself. I was showing up to work late, and two weeks after the initial ordeal, my dumbass manager decided to fire me. And he didn't even give a crap about what was happening. I was waiting for payday in order for me to hopefully rent somewhere. But no, all of that was out the question. So with me jobless, without much money, and living in my car, I thought I needed some time away. So I drove up to the forest, got my camping gear, which fortunately was in the car from a previous trip, and started making my way with the little provisions I had into the woods. There was no plan, honestly, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to come back, but I knew that I needed time for myself, and this was definitely the best way I was going to get that. I set off into the woods early one morning, and just kept on walking. I tried to keep track of my trail. I knew the woods quite well, and thought that I would definitely be able to make my way back. After a few days of hiking and camping, and trying to find myself again, I was starting to feel a little better, after the initial two nights of crying myself to sleep, being fueled by anger, rage, hate, and sadness. It was on the third day that I came to a pristine creek. It was absolutely lovely, and even though it was quite cold for autumn, I decided to go for a little dip. It was there where I met Charlie. Charlie was an interesting man. He came in about an hour after me, and just as I was planning on leaving, we struck up a conversation. He was telling me all about the area. Apparently he was somewhat of an expert, and had lived there for quite some time. Out of everything he said to me though, he gave me a fair warning. He looked me dead in the eyes and said, Son, be wary. This is Bigfoot season. I gave out a little chuckle, thinking that he was playing a practical joke on me, but his face remained stern. What? It's Bigfoot season, son. Best stay safe out there. I wouldn't go much further into the woods if I were you. I tried to play along. I didn't want to be dismissive and rude, so I told him that I would heed his warning and thanked him for his time, and within ten minutes, I was on my way. I was a bit confused. I wasn't really sure if he was serious or not. The time we spent together, he seemed like a genuinely nice person, but that warning really got to me. The seriousness on his face, 
The way he delivered that exact line really made me wonder. Another part of me wondered if he was just a serial killer, and warning me that if I go any further, something bad would happen to me, and he would try and attribute it to the supernatural. I guess I'd never know. I carried on anyway. I calculated that if I portioned my rations, I'd have enough food for another eight or so days. And you know what? I wasn't even all that hungry. So I just carried on going at a leisurely pace. I found a clearing that evening and started a small fire and kept myself warm while reading my book. I was trying to distract myself as much as possible from the painful thoughts which invaded my mind constantly. And that was the best remedy for now. The book was making me sleepy though and I started passing out. So I crawled into my tent and fell asleep. Halfway through the night though, something woke me up. I heard a huge stomping sound. It sounded like an elephant was running past my tent and I woke up incredibly scared. The sound was gone in an instant though and part of me assumed I was dreaming it. Of course, with the warning of Bigfoot fresh in my mind, that is instantly what my mind jumped to. But I told myself that it was impossible, that Bigfoot is an urban legend, a myth, and that there's no way there's one out here in the forest. So I tried my best to calm myself and fell back asleep. Next morning, I got up and carried on with my trek. I was now in unknown territory. I had never walked this far before and was feeling quite proud of myself for managed to attain such a length. My ex-girlfriend was never much of a hiker. She couldn't handle more than three or four days, to be honest, even when we really pushed ourselves, despite the fact she was quite sporty. But that was besides the point, and in the past now, I was doing this for myself. And the longer I spent out there, mostly alone, the better I became. I started to accept the fact that things were changing and that they were outside of my control. I wasn't sure that I'd done anything wrong, but I was sure that if she didn't value me for who I was, then she didn't deserve me. And that was starting to become a more comforting and reassuring thought. I carried on walking until I came to a beautiful clearing. It was the middle of the day, and something about this clearing really impacted me, and I decided that I would just drop my stuff and have a little chill. I dropped everything, put out my little mat, and just lied there and enjoyed the sun while it was out. I was listening to the trees and trying my best to attune myself to nature in this pristine environment in this golden moment, when that's when I heard the sound again. The sound which I thought was in my dream last night. But alas, the stampede of an elephant, or the sound equivalent, was not too far off. I instantly jolted up, eyes darting around the clearing. But alas, I couldn't see a thing. I was starting to get scared. What could be making such a thunderous noise out in the middle of nowhere? There was nobody here. There was no reason for anyone to go this deep. And even if they were, how could they make such a loud noise? After a while, the sound faded away into the distance. And I just sat there and debated whether to carry on or not. The way that I was heading would mean I'd have to go in the direction the sound came from and I wasn't entirely sure if I wanted to do that. After about 15 minutes of debating, I decided to push myself and said that it must be something in nature and that I shouldn't be worried. So, out of sheer stupidity or ballsiness, I carried on. Not before long though, after about another maybe hour of walking, that I came across what scared me the most. I was walking, just humming to myself in the forest, when I saw something move 
down below. I looked, and it was this huge creature, shaggy, with brown matted fur, or hair. It was quick, and it was agile, and I'm pretty sure it noticed that I saw it. The moment our eyes met, it bolted further down into the forest. I stood there frozen. As it ran, the noise it made was the exact noise I'd heard earlier and the night before. I knew exactly what I had encountered. The warning was correct. And without saying a word, I turned my little butt around and made exit of that forest in three days when it had taken me five to get there. I didn't sleep well after that, and the breakup was the last thing on my mind. I got back to my car, drove to my parents' house, finally got the courage to ask them for a short-term loan, and sorted my shit together. Maybe it was the universe giving me a wake-up call. Maybe it was just pure coincidence. And even though it was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me, and made me seriously doubt that science knows everything, it made me realise what was important in life, and that they were no longer part of my life, and therefore not important. So it may have been terrifying, but I am grateful. When my grandmother was a young girl, she and her family lived in the south of Mexico, in a very small village. She would tell me tales of how she would explore the ruins and all the strange things in the surrounding areas. She would tell me stories of how apparently the ruins were everywhere, and you would be able to find small pyramids, medium pyramids, and even some larger pyramid structures that time had seemingly forgot, and the jungle overtaken. I loved hearing these stories from my grandmother, and my curiosity and fascination with all things left behind grew. She did, however, tell me cautionary tales, and that there were some things that you should never do, that you should be careful going out at night. If you saw the small dwarf people, run, and run fast, and never offer them anything. She told me about the big cats that roamed the jungle, and about the danger that they can bring, not to mention how dangerous they are if they are encountered, how easily they can kill you. However, one thing that stood out in my mind is what she called Las Escaleras al Infierno, or the Stairs to Hell. She said that on one occasion, she and another friend of about 14 we're just exploring the jungle as you do. It was a small village, and sadly she didn't get much of an education. So, her and her friend, when they weren't doing chores, would just explore and play around. They decided one day to go to a part of the jungle that they had never been. Being natural explorers, they tried to go and see everywhere they could outside of their small village, when they stumbled upon something rather odd. They came across what appeared to be stairs. Stairs leading to nowhere. They went up roughly 15 steps, and then nothing. At first, the girls were quite curious as to what this could be and what it could mean. But they were quite unsettled, as there were no signs of a building ever having been in that area. She told me that the stairs were made of stone, but not built in a way that she was familiar with, and that they didn't resemble the pyramid steps, which could certainly be found all over the jungle. Her and her friend walked around it, just to be sure it was there, and were very very unsure of why it was there. So they of course decided that it would be best to, to try and climb the stairs, 
my grandmother's friend went first. She started walking up the steps, and after she reached about the sixth, she got a bad feeling. I mean, the stairs went to nowhere, so it would almost be pointless going up them, my grandmother would say. And as she walked back down, she said to my grandmother, Don't bother, it's pointless. They don't go anywhere. They carried on exploring that day, but felt rather creeped out by what they had experienced, and decided to head home. Why were there random stairs in the middle of the woods? Perhaps someone had a house here before, but it had got burnt down, and only the stone stairs remained. That seemed to be the most plausible explanation. So, upon returning to the village, they asked around, but no one had ever claimed to have lived out there, let alone seen the stairs. All of it was quite confusing. The very next day, my grandmother's friend brings her father along to the stairs. They take a while trying to find it, but find it they do, and there are the stairs just as before. The father approaches the stairs, walks around them, and says to the girls, Tell me none of you have gone up these. My grandmother shakes her head, but the daughter of the man looks up with sullen eyes. She admits that she has, and the man takes her by the shoulders and starts shaking her, saying how could she be so foolish. My grandmother at that moment, and also the daughter, were very, very confused as to why he was having a reaction to some random stares. I mean, it was more mysterious than anything, but not something to be frightened of, right? The father went on to explain that whenever they see these, it's always a bad omen, and they've always been told never to approach them, as rare as they may be. They go back to the village, and a few days later, my grandmother's friend is stricken with an illness that nearly takes her life. Fortunately though, she survived, but she was told by a local shaman that bad spirits inhabit the area surrounding the stairs, and that it was a foolish mistake, and to never approach them again. My grandmother learnt a lesson that day, and although back then in southern rural Mexico there wasn't much access to medicine, so it could have likely been a disease of some kind, it always rung in my mind. Could it have been something supernatural? I'm not entirely sure. Some years later, I decided I wanted to reconnect with my Mexican heritage, after living most my life in the US and never having been to Mexico. After speaking with my grandma, she told me the name of her town, and I went there to try and find it, but sadly couldn't. Maybe it no longer exists. I tried going to the area where she said she was from, because part of me wanted to find the stairs, and just to know if they were still there. I tried for about a week, and did find some cool ruins, but I never found the stairs. It does make me wonder though. I was a land surveyor for about 25 years until that work just vanished in 2007. I worked in the woods and swamps of Florida. Back in the 1980s, I had found a human skeleton in some woods. Turned out to be an old man with dementia that had wandered away from his caregivers. 20 years later, I was working in Collier, Florida, in an area called Golden Gate which has large areas of wooded property with roads cutting through it. I'd walked just off the road and came across the edges of plastic bags that were buried in the middle of this, and there were bones. I saw some ribs and some vertebrae that looked to be the right size to be human. I called the local law, and a deputy came out, and he did not like what it looked like. They brought out a whole team of people and cordoned off the area and dug it all up. Once the whole bunch was exposed, it turned out to be a deer carcass some hunters had buried in the woods. Over the years, 
There were lots of weird things, including once tripping over something in thick woods. That was a headstone of a grave. It then turned out there was a small cemetery there that had been reclaimed by the woods. We once came across an area in central California where we found a bunch of square and rectangular clearings in the trees where nothing grew. There were lots of broken glass and old junk scattered around as well. And then we found the concrete foundation of a fairly large building. I did some research and found out we had been the site of a small town and a sawmill. The area was logged out at about 1940 and it was a ghost town. Sometime in the 40s it burnt down. I guess the fires from where the building stood killed the soil when nothing would grow there. The name of the place is Horsia, Florida. There is one building that does still stand, and that was the post office. This happened 20 years ago, and it's a night I'll never forget. I had gotten into a fight with my parents. Basically, I wanted to go on a vacation with my girlfriend alone. Bear in mind we were both 15 at this point, neither of us could drive, and I wanted my parents to drive me and her to a little hotel about an hour away, with a pool and all kinds of funky things, so we could just spend a nice weekend together for our two month together anniversary. I also said to my parents that I'd saved up the money from my paper route and that I would be able to pay for all of it. Little did I know that they would react this way and said I was being really immature when I had a freak out and told them that I was never coming back. I went over to my girlfriend's house to tell her the bad news and asked to crash there. But of course, her parents were less than thrilled when I asked and said that it was best that I make my way home. Thank goodness I didn't tell them about our little plan. But not wanting to go home, and wanting to spite my parents for making me feel dumb and not giving in to my demands, I decided to go pay a visit to my friend, Jimmy. Jimmy lived a little bit out of the way. I had to walk into the woods and then turn off and into his long driveway as he lived out in the middle of nowhere. After the half hour of walking, I finally made it. And after knocking on his basement room window, he opened the back door and let me in. We had a good old chat, and Jimmy was one of the people who could always make you see sense, at least in my case, and asked how I would feel if I were older, and I insisted that I'd be totally cool with it. He gave me a little grin, and he said, how about we go chill in the treehouse for a while? I'd already walked about half hour to get here, and the treehouse was about another 25 minutes into the deep, deep woods. But I was feeling it. Part of me wanted to really stick it to my old man and my mum, because they just didn't understand what I was going through with Sky. Whatever. So I went for it. We put some snacks into our backpack, and made our way into the woods. When we got to the treehouse, we climbed up the rope and just started chilling and shooting the shit. We were laughing, looking at comics that he had there, and generally having a good time. When out of nowhere came this weird ass noise. The only way I can describe it is, imagine the sound you hear when there's an explosion. That sound that very sound, but only the beginning bit. As weird as that may be, that's exactly what it was. A very large boom that then quickly, almost immediately, caved in on itself and almost created an anti-boom. I don't even know how to describe it, but that's what we heard. When we realised what happened, we looked at each other. It was quite dark when it happened and couldn't have been anywhere near past 10pm. However, that noise freaked us out, and no time seemed to have passed from the point where it started to where it finished. So, confused, dazed, and a little bit weirded out, 
we decided it was time to go. So, without even managing to touch the snacks, as to us, we'd only been there about two hours, we went down the rope and started the walk back in the dark, after pulling out a flashlight and making our way quickly. Just as we were approaching the house though, the sun was starting to rise. That's when I noticed a cop car in his driveway. We were starting to get creeped out. Sun rising? Cop car? What the hell happened to us? My parents were there, and they were in tears. My mother told me to never run away like that again, and that she was sorry that she yelled. My dad, who tried to never show any emotion, as he saw it as a display of weakness, just stood there with a little tear in his eye and tried to stay stern, but gave me a big bear hug. I asked them what was up, and they said that I'd been gone for 10 hours. It was quite early in the morning. When I looked at my watch, I saw how early it was and was very, very freaked out. My friend and I both looked at each other completely dumbfounded and weren't sure how exactly time had passed so quickly when seemingly we'd lost absolutely none. We weren't even tired yet. We went home and didn't speak about it for another week. Back at school, I finally had the courage to talk to him about it. And one of the things after that happened is that we were extremely jet lagged. I started going to bed stupidly early and waking up at very early hours in the morning. Something screwed with my system. And to this day, I don't have an explanation for what it was or why it happened. All I know is that we never went back to the treehouse again. This is not my story, but I would like to share it regardless. My friend's dad was snowmobiling on a frozen lake, and the ice started breaking. They got off the snowmobile in time, but it went through the ice. My dad's friend didn't want to lose track of where the snowmobile was, so that he could recover it in the spring. So he got his heated dry suit, loaded up his scuba gear, and went back into the hole in the ice. His plan was to attach a big rope to the snowmobile, which he could anchor to the shore, so they could recover it by boat in the spring. So he goes through the hole and into the frozen lake. The water was only around 20 to 30 feet deep, and the area he was in was a flooded forest. So he found himself in this eerie nightmare forest of skeletal trees dimly lit by the sunset coming through the ice hole, and with the faintest light making its way through the ice and snow everywhere else. He couldn't immediately see the snowmobile, so he turned on his underwater flashlight and started looking. He turned around, and behind him, not more than 15 feet away, stood this monstrous humanoid form. In his panicked reaction, he only got a glimpse of it, but it was at least 15 feet tall, insanely proportioned with a huge pot belly and spindly outstretched arms, long skinny legs, and a huge demonic face. As I said, it was only a momentary glimpse, because in his panicked reaction, he bolted for the ice hole. Once out the water, he calmed down and tried to process what he'd seen, but couldn't make heads or tails of it. After about 20 minutes of calming down, he went back to investigate and found the snowmobile. The monster turned out to be a moose buck that must have gone through the ice. Its antlers and head had gotten tangled up in some tree branches, so it was standing upright, hind legs touching the lake bottom, front legs outstretched. Even knowing exactly what it was, it was really creepy. They found and later recovered the snowmobile, and recovered the moose corpse too, so that it wouldn't foul the water near people's homes. This happened in the Lake District in the UK. Camping with my parents and my two brothers and close family friends. Two parents, three kids, 
who were pitched about 30 feet away from our tents. Family Friends has a daughter a little older than me, so we're sharing a tent. There's no one else around, and no other campers in this particular area. In the middle of the night, I woke up to my friend shaking me awake. She said she'd been out to pee, and that she was sure she saw someone walking behind her parents' tent. I told her it was probably one of her parents, and she said no, and that whoever it was was taller than both of our dads, who were both a little over six feet. I told her to stop trying to scare me, when we heard a, what the hell? And then a loud yell. We unzipped our tents, and so did everyone else in time to see this huge man running up a hill into the night, while my friend's dad was chasing him. We were all really confused, and stood there while my mum's friend said that some random man had unzipped their tent and tried to lay down on the airbed with them. My friend's dad chased him, but eventually lost him, saying the guy scaled the fence and disappeared. We were packed up by the time my dad found him, and brought him back to the site. No one knew who the man was, and after sleeping in our cars in a car park, we went to a pub bed and breakfast close by, and told the story, and the barkeeper said, Oh, that's just Desmond. After his granny died, he took off to live in the lakes, like that was the most normal thing in the world. Desmond, you scared the shit out of us. Backpacking through a forest in northern Queensland, with my very best buddy. It's very humid, mosquitoes and shit, and tropical weather at its finest. We went off the path, as we are both seasoned hikers, literally cutting a path through all the lantana and other vines with our trusty machetes. About an hour in, we stopped for a break. That's when we heard the drums. Slow, rhythmic drumming. Tribal. Deep. And very, very out of place. This was 2005, after all. We looked at each other, and silently agreed to go towards the drumming noises and investigate. We crept through the bush until we were confronted with another wall of lantana. The drumming was coming from the other side, and we could now hear laughing, voices, and chanting along with the drums. We decided to go for broke, slashed through the wall of vines, and walked through, right into the weirdest shit I've ever seen. About 30 islanders, dancing around a fire and playing drums. Grass skirt, bone necklaces, the works. They all froze and stared at us. We stared back, unsure what to do next. Then the director ran out yelling, CUT! What the hell are you guys doing? We had stumbled into the film set of a chocolate bar commercial. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories, and to all of those who I promised stairs in the woods, I think this is the best I can do for now. Literally the only story was sent to me by someone, so I hope you all enjoyed. Like I said at the start, if you'd like to check out my second channel, I would extremely appreciate it, and you can find the link in the description at the very top. And you also get to have a face reveal and a Pandora reveal if you are so inclined. Please be gentle, be sure to leave feedback, positive or negative, it's always appreciated as it does help me improve. And yeah, if you could subscribe and check it out, it would really mean a lot to me. So thank you. If you liked this video though, please don't forget to leave a comment and drop a like as well. I do post new content every night, so please be sure to subscribe and hit that little bell icon for good measure to be up to date every time I post. If there is a story that you wish to share, much like some of these, feel free to send them to my email, or alternatively post it to my brand new Reddit page. Just be sure to include plenty of punctuation, paragraphing, and description to optimise the chances of your story being selected. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.